So good morning, everyone. We had a new grandmas today. Uh, we had a special speaker today. Uh, it's Dr. Uh, Hilary uh, Hinson. Uh, she is an associate professor uh, of neurocritical care, uh, neurology and emergency medicine at Oregon Health and Science University. Uh, she serves as the associate uh, director of the clinical research in the uh, neuroscience uh, ICU at the OSHU and is a member of the ANN Science Committee and serves of the editorial board of the journals of neurology, stroke, neurotrauma. Uh, she identifies herself as a computational neurology and research in both uh, the developing uh, precision strategies for the treatment of acute brain injury, such as TBI, uh, by applying integrative approaches that includes high dimensional molecular clinical data to in, uh, infer uh, predictive predict models of disease related phenotypes. Uh, also, uh, Dr. Hinson is a national leader in equity initiatives. She founded the AEN uh, LGBTQI section in 2017 and served up as a, is a inaugural chair from 2018 to the 2020. Dr. Uh, Hinson serves uh, of the American Heart Association uh, Journal uh, Editorial Board and is uh, one of the two uh, editorial board associate directors for the Journal of Neurology. Uh, she completed her um, medical training in the University of Texas uh, in San Antonio in 2005. She's uh, also completed her neurology residency in the University of Maryland in 2009. And after that, she completed her training of neurocritical care at John Hopkins. And she's been a faculty at Oregon uh, since 2011. And also she has a master's degree in uh, clinical research in 2016. So I just had to say that uh, Dr. Hinson is like a rock star uh, in this field. And uh, I want to just be uh, very thankful for her to take any time to uh, talk to us. And also she's in a very big time difference in waking up so early. And thank you so much, Dr. Hinson. Sergio, thank you so much for that really kind introduction. And yeah, it is a touch early on the on the West Coast. I'm glad Grand Round started at nine and not eight. That would have been even uh, more difficult, but uh, I really appreciate the kind invitation. So thank you all very much for uh, inviting me here sort of virtually to, uh, to give this talk. And uh, the title of today's talk is Battling Stigma, where LGBTQI health intersects with neurology. And so with that, we'll go ahead and get started. Before we jump into the talk today, I wanted to offer a few disclosures and acknowledgements. Uh, I do some consulting work uh, on a stroke trial, and I also, as Sergio mentioned, do some editorial work for a couple of journals. Um, and then also I've been very fortunate to receive funding uh, for my work in traumatic brain injury, none of which I'll be speaking about today. So today's uh, topic is pretty different than, uh, than my research work. But if you're interested, I definitely will go on ad nauseum about modeling and uh, stats and uh, learning R and all kinds of things. But uh, that'll have to be saved for another, another day. Well, let's talk a little bit about today's talk and the roadmap for today. And so what I'd like to lead you through here in today's topic in LGBTQI health is first to establish that stigma leads to healthcare disparities for sexual and gender minorities. Then I'd like to review a bit of what we term SOGI terminology. And so that stands for sexual orientation or and gender identity, uh, particularly as this relates to the electronic health record, um, but then just very generally, just so folks are on the same page about the, the terms that are often used in this space. And then I'd like to give you some examples of how uh, LGBTQI identity intersects very specific neurologic illness. So not just sort of general health, which I think many of us uh, have the appreciation for, but rather how this really impacts us as neurologists and those that uh, take care of neuro neurologically ill patients. I'll then review a few cultural competency initiatives that you might choose to take part in uh, if you're desiring to learn more. And then I'll leave you with some references uh, to learn and to work on your own if, you, uh, if you'd like. Of course, we're going to start with a case. It wouldn't be neuro grand rounds without starting with a case. And so, uh, so this is a 65-year-old uh, right-handed man. He presents to Dementia Clinic. He lives alone. He manages his own medications. He admits he's becoming a bit more forgetful and sometimes missing medications and starting to have some more frequent falls. He's not really leaving the house anymore, and he's stopped attending social activities. And you notice during the uh, examination and the interview that he's slow to answer questions and perhaps a little bit apathetic. 
we'll return to that case in a moment, but uh, I'd like to give you some sort of some foundational knowledge uh, in this space. And first is this concept that despite the evolution in social attitudes, LGBT identified persons still face significant stigma. And that stigma really leads to healthcare disparities. And this takes many different forms uh, depending on the specific individual, but this can include inconsistent access to coverage, silence regarding important health issues, and underutilization of the, of the healthcare system, leading to delay in diagnosis and treatment at times. I also wanted to share with you uh, some updated demographics. I was actually just updating this piece in my slide set uh, just yesterday, and I I was struck by the uh, evol sort of the evolution of different uh, percentages of the population, different generations that identify as LGBT, so that's lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender. Um, and you can see that those percentage points are increasing for those uh, of the younger generations. I don't think this is necessarily reflective of a change, true change in demographics. I think it reflects a little bit more uh, of an increasing openness of the culture and the ability to identify in these groups more safely without uh, the risk of uh, significant uh, social harms. But uh, there aren't no social harms. And so we'll talk about that in a, in a moment, but uh, this was this was quite striking to me. If you look at the percentages overall, this uh, equates to about 5.6% of the American population identifying as lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender. So in, now this is a little bit older data now, but I still think it's pertinent. In 2009, there was a survey of LGBT uh, respondents and uh, more than half of those identifying as lesbian, gay, or bisexual, and the majority of those identifying as transgender reported at least one instance uh, where they experienced discrimination in the healthcare system. And that could be something more subtle, uh, such as, um, being misgendered or uh, having healthcare uh, professionals uh, sort of be curt with them to something much more overt, such as harsh language, physically abusive or rough, or even taking excessive barrier precautions to do a physical examination. There was a semi-recent article actually in the well section in the New York Times uh, that covered this data as well and uh, speaking to uh, a handful of individuals who had experience some real challenges in being in the inpatient setting um, as transgender uh, folks. So as I mentioned, the majority of folks identifying as transgender had experienced some kind of serious healthcare discrimination. And this led actually to almost half of, uh, of these folks delaying needed preventative care or even urgent care uh, when serious health issues arise. And I think everyone on this uh, in this meeting can imagine how delaying preventative care can be extremely serious. And in fact, when folks present, uh, the health condition can be actually uh, quite severe, quite advanced, and much more difficult to treat. So I think all of us really recognize that this is a huge problem. There is actually some study on uh, stigma and how it negatively impacts healthcare. So interestingly, uh, LGBT or LGB uh, uh, pe people who have experienced a prejudice related stressful life event are three times more likely than those that did not to experience a serious healthcare problem over the one year period following that event. And the exposure to discrimination was actually directly related, directly associated with number of sick days and physician visits. And so those experiences of what might be, you know, sort of thought of superficially as a psychosocial event actually do have direct healthcare um, uh, consequences for these patients. So while we think, oh, well, social ad attitudes have evolved so dramatically and with the advent of marriage equality, how could there possibly be any stigma left? You know, why is, uh, is, isn't this something that's relegated to the, to the dusty past? And I would argue that uh, that's not the case at all. I, this is sort of the rip from the headline slide, if you will. Um, and I pulled a number of these different articles were very recently, um, particularly with this focus on uh, transgender children. I think many of you might be aware of uh, a recent sort of um, uh, kind of declaration by the governor of Texas, my home state actually, uh, who said that uh, they would start identifying parents of transgender children and in fact start to investigate these parents 
uh, for child abuse if they offered or supported their children in gender affirming uh, health care. And perhaps that may even extend to healthcare providers. There's an injunction, actually, a judge halted this uh, as, as policy in Texas just this week. So this is very recent uh, sort of events here in the U.S. and uh, not sort of uh, something historically that we would, we would talk about, but rather something very, very timely, uh, unfortunately. So stigma um, is alive and well uh, in the United States, I would, I would argue. There are some special considerations for our LGBTQI seniors, uh, some, some very specific uh, issues that impact them directly. And so uh, particularly for the older generations, this lifetime of employment discrimination prior to the codification of non-discrimination and laws uh, nationwide has unfortunately resulted in some cases of a lifetime of underemployment or unemployment actually and contributes to high poverty rates. And this sometimes is um, emphasized or underscored by a, uh, a relationship with a, a family of origin that is not necessarily always uh, very supportive. So, um, so unfortunately, all of these things contribute to uh, poverty rates. And so you can see the statistics on the slide that there's almost a, a doubling of poverty rates amongst uh, elder lesbian and gay couples, respectively, compared to their heterosexual counterparts. Um, and the other piece, even if poverty is not in the picture, is isolation. And so LGBT uh, older uh, individuals are twice as likely to live alone and twice as likely to be single and three to four times less likely to have children. And as I mentioned earlier, some are uh, estranged from their family of origin, which increases this uh, isolation. So these are really important factors because we know things such as isolation in older individuals uh, can contribute to uh, the worsening of, uh, of dementia very specifically. We saw that a lot with the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, as folks, families couldn't visit their loved ones, you know, in elder care and this type of thing. So we know this to, to be a pretty pervasive problem. And I'd like to remind the group that stigma impacts clinicians as well. And so uh, there is pervasive stigma against sexual. So SGM, I should tell you, is sexual and gender minorities. And so this is an umbrella term that impact that uh, sort of encompasses the entire LGBTQIA plus plus community and is a little bit more compact as an acronym. And so I, I use it pretty often. Um, additionally, it's known that the stress of concealing one's identity in the workplace uh, can contribute to um, uh, to things such as burnout and dissatisfaction with one's job. And so this could be potentially contributing to, um, to burnout in, uh, in neurologists. We don't have direct data on that, but I'm going to share with you a little bit of uh, data that we have a little later in the talk that uh, this impacts neurologists very directly. So when we know from uh, the AN's burnout survey that burnout is an issue. I mean, it, it's an issue throughout medicine, right? Particularly coming out of uh, these years in the pandemic. And, um, and it was an issue for neurologists even before uh, COVID-19. And so uh, keeping this as a, on our radar, I think is important as well. I will get more deeply into this survey later in the talk, but, uh, but we did survey actually uh, through the AAN uh, a, a, a selected population of, uh, of neurologists, which I'll talk about more later. But we know from this group that um, those respondents to the survey uh, a handful did identify as sexual and gender minorities, not surprisingly, and, uh, and not all of those individuals were actually open about their identity at work, even now. This was just a, a few years ago when we conducted this survey. So again, this is not something that's sort of relegated to the past. This is definitely an, uh, an ongoing issue that, that we should address as a field. In 2016, the uh, NIH designated sexual and gender minorities formally as a population for disparities research, um, which is absolutely great that this was recognized. It's not that uh, this group just became a, a, a population uh, that was experiencing disparities, but rather it was recognized that this is a, a worthy of study, which means that there is now uh, very specific grant funding designated for, for this uh, to be studied more carefully and for us to start to address some of these disparities. So this is really an, an excellent um, uh, sort of evolution. Uh, 
So I'll return back to case one. You'll remember from a few slides ago. So after uh, our, this is our, our gentleman in a dementia clinic who's been more forgetful. And so after a careful chart review, you discover that your patient is HIV positive and has not unfortunately been consistently on, um, on uh, HART. And since the death of his partner in the late 1990s, he's lived alone primarily and has only recently obtained Medicare because he's uh, you know, turned 65. You assay a CD4 count, which is 110. And so now with this com more complete picture, uh, it makes you wonder, could this potentially be HIV associated dementia? Uh, and so you refer the patient for uh, highly active antiretroviral therapy as well as some further testing. And so had you not known this, uh, these facts about your patient, you might just simply assume that this patient was uh, exhibiting a, a more common Alzheimer's type dementia. And that still could be the case but uh, the differential changes a little bit with this really important information. So let's talk a little bit about some of the terminology uh, or SOGI terminology, as I mentioned earlier, sexual orientation and gender identity. I wanna just make sure that we're all on the same page with this because sometimes this is uh, slightly confused. I, in my editorial roles uh, at a couple of journals, I see this with uh, authors and clinical research pretty often where gender and sex is conflated quite a bit. And, uh, and so just to break it down, so uh, gender identity and sex are, uh, are two pretty different uh, concepts. So sex is sex assigned at birth, which uh, is either male, female, or intersex. And gender identity is the way in which a person moves through the world and chooses to express themselves. It's based on a person's internal sense of self, and that's formed generally in early childhood and then is carried forward throughout that person's life. Um, when gender identity and sex assigned at birth align, then that person is identified as a cisgendered individual. If they don't align, then that person uh, is, may identify as transgender, or non-binary or a number of other identities, which reflects that person's gender identity. Sexual orientation is completely separate from that. And that describes uh, uh, sexual attraction and is independent and scales independently from gender identity. There's a ways in which uh, different health systems have captured uh, sexual orientation, gender identity in the medical records. And I would argue that this is an incredibly important thing to, uh, to catalog actually in the medical record and to make healthcare providers aware of. And I'll show you some examples in a moment. But uh, this particular group uh, had, I had queried uh, a group of uh, individuals in primary care and identified a series of questions that seemed to be helpful uh, uh, specifically in, in this setting, which I would argue would be you know, applicable to really any medical setting. So they asked two questions. And so the first of which gets at sexual orientation. And then the, the second is, uh, gets at gender identity. And again, these two things are, are independent. So you can see that uh, this is the way in which they queried uh, these patients to self-describe. And what they found is that when they uh, queried about uh, 300 patients in primary care, that the consensus was that the patients didn't mind being asked. There's always a reluctance sometimes. Well, I wouldn't say always, but there is occasionally a reluctance amongst healthcare providers to actually ask these questions like, oh, is this person going to be offended? Are they even going to understand what I'm talking about? And at least this survey data indicates that uh, patients not only are open to being asked about this in the clinical setting, but second, understand what the questions mean and feel uh, in general very positive about answering these questions and understand the interrelationship these questions have with that person's health. And, uh, and so when I'm asked about how to, to quantify some of these uh, types of things, then I'll oftentimes offer these questions. This is not the only way to ask about this, but at least we have some data that um, these particular questions are uh, useful uh, when trying to obtain this information from your patients. This is a screenshot from Epic. Uh, it's a few versions back now, but, um, and again, this is like no uh, commercial for Epic as the electronic health record. It's what we use, but you know, uh, you may use something different. But what was interesting about this particular study was that uh, when they went back and queried Epic uh, health records in 2015, 
uh, this group noticed that only about 45% of records reflected uh, the gender of, inti uh, of an intimate partner. And uh, the, the factors that were associated with this information being absent were older age, Medicare uh, as a payer, uh, both were associated with poor documentation. So that was sort of an interesting observation about what might have been underlying this. And again, it's potentially a fear of asking um, some of the, the more senior generations to, uh, to be forthcoming with this information. Um, again, this is something that you will see in Epic. Uh, and again, this is a, a few versions back, a little bit older now, but you can see how this information can, uh, can pop up and can be really useful and very helpful if, for example, you're trying to, you know, just interact with your patient. You really want to use the, the, the name that they prefer to be called and, uh, and to, uh, to use, again, pronouns that they prefer. And we'll get into that a little bit um, uh, later in the talk. So you may be asking yourself, okay, it's well and good to, uh, to be affirmative to your patients, to respect their, uh, the ways in which they identify in the world, but how does this directly relate to neurology? You know, maybe this is just a primary care issue, has nothing to do with their epilepsy or their Parkinson's disease. Why are you talking to me about this? And I'd like to make some cases that, that um, or some use cases where this actually matters quite a great deal. We're gonna start with the second case. So this is a 45-year-old uh, left-handed woman who has a history of brittle diet, type 1 diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and also has recurrent refractory seizures. She was uh, well-controlled on Keppra until about two years ago and uh, had uh, generalized seizures are now becoming more frequent two to three times a week. Previously, it had been two to three uh, a month or uh, every couple months, actually. So the patient has no mesial temporal sclerosis. You can see uh, the MRI scan, the handy arrow pointing us in the right direction there on the right-hand side of the screen. And so after you obtain more history uh, and you notice that the seizure frequency seemed to coincide with gender-affirming hormone therapy, and you make note of that as something to investigate a little bit further. There hasn't been a tremendous amount of work in this area, although it's a really fruitful area that I, I hope will be continued to be investigated, but there was a great review article that was published in 2017 by a group out of Hopkins looking at um, just a, a cross section of, uh, of patients uh, that uh, and they sort of made a compendium of the literature, but I, but the the, um, the sort of takeaway from that particular article, which I would refer to you as as quite good actually, was looking at specifically uh, the different anti-epileptic drugs or anti-seizure drugs, I should call them, and uh, looking at the ways in which uh, each of these medications could uh, could actually modify. Um, uh, hormone use and or be modified by uh, the administration of exogenous hormones. And so uh, this particular chart uh, shows uh, testosterone and estrogen, but it's really an important uh, observation to know that there can be interactions with anti-seizure medication and exogenous hormone use. And that's helpful for all patients, regardless of their, of their gender identity, but it becomes especially pertinent for those taking gender affirming hormones. And um, so unfortunately, no very large epidemiologic studies exist uh, looking at patients that are taking gender affirming hormones and are on anti seizure medications. But this is something that you can apply directly to your patients if this is, uh, this is specific to, uh, to their case, because modifying their anti seizure medications may have an impact uh, on their gender affirming hormones and vice versa. So weighing those and being really thoughtful about uh, that can be uh, very meaningful for your patients. I also wanted to call your attention to a recent scientific statement uh, that was published in circulation just now uh, about two years ago, looking at cardiovascular health in uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer adults. And I liked this particular conceptualization of the factors. And so you can see how complex and interwoven uh, many of these factors are that result in uh, increasing cardiovascular mor morbidity and mortality. So it's not just sort of uh, a very simple direct one-on-one -on -one relationship. There are a lot of layers of life stressors, psychosocial factors that contribute to very well-described cardiovascular risk factors such as obesity, hypertension, high cholesterol, 
these are interwoven with behavioral factors. So for example, tobacco use is higher in some segments of uh, sexual and gender minority populations than it is in the general public. Um, and that is thought to have a relationship to experience of uh, social stressors, et cetera. So there are a lot of really complex interplays uh, with these factors that may lead to increasing cardiovascular uh, risk for patients that identify as uh, sexual or gender minorities. So here's some specific kind of take home points that are pulled from this literature. To, to make you aware. So first off, uh, just as I mentioned, uh, LGBTQ adults are more likely to use tobacco than their heterosexual cisgender uh, counterparts. Sexual minority women are more likely to have elevated BMI. Uh, something that's much more complicated, and I'll show you some uh, literature specifically aimed at this, but just very generally, the use of gender affirming hormones may be associated with cardiometabolic changes and much more study is needed to unpack this. I'll show you what's been done so far. And then longitudinal research that examines these mechanisms as well as social determinants of health is really essential in these populations. So again, this is another reason why it's fantastic that um, the NIH has designated uh, this group as a, a group worthy of study to address some of these um, healthcare disparities. So let's talk a little bit about um, gender minorities and cardiovascular disease. This is an emerging area that's not completely understood, but I can share with you some data. So the first of which came from, uh, and, and some of you might be familiar with this uh, particular uh, mechanism, but it's the behavioral risk factor surveillance system. Essentially what, uh, what this does, and it's not just aimed at this one topic, it's very, very broad. Uh, does random digit dialing in the era of cell phones. I can't believe this still works, but it does. So uh, through random digit dialing, they have these very large uh, cross-sectional population studies. And this gives them the ability to identify uh, larger numbers of folks that identify as transgender and compare them with their cisgender uh, counterparts to look for things such as cardiovascular disease, stroke particularly, and we know from these uh, data that there are higher self-reported uh, rates of cardiovascular disease, uh, in, uh, particularly in uh, transgender women uh, versus cisgendered men or cisgendered women. Uh, but this is all self-report. So there are some limitations to self-report data, of course. There was, um, and this is probably the best study that I'm aware that exists to date, a very large cross-sectional uh, uh, data uh, sort of cohort study that was done in the Kaiser system. And uh, you may be familiar with uh, Kaiser Permanente in that they have some advantages in that uh, their electronic health record is very well synchronized amongst the different sites. Patients uh, tend to stay in this healthcare system for a very long period of time. So in this particular cohort study, they were able to match, do some matching of um, transgender and cisgender uh, individuals. And uh, they matched very carefully on some key uh, demographics, uh, including race and ethnicity, year of birth within about five years. So controlling for age, study site, which is key because there are geographical uh, var variations in health, and then calendar of membership. And so they were able to control for how long this patient had had access to pretty similar healthcare. And using that very careful matching system, uh, they were able to, uh, to try to quantify the incidence of stroke and trans feminine patients. And they, they did this amongst all the groups uh, and did not find differences, particularly in cisgender men, cisgendered women, and uh, transgender men. But I pull out actually this incidence of stroke in, in trans feminine patients specifically to call your attention to um, this subpopulation in which they were able to compare the rate of stroke in trans feminine women versus cisgendered men and cisgendered women in these sort of dashed lines here at the bottom. And you can see the incidence is a bit higher. And this was only particularly true for individuals in the trans feminine cohort that had started exogenous or um, gender affirming estrogen within the period of study. And 
the other interesting thing here, and it needs to be uh, verified in other cohorts, is that unlike postmenopausal women on hormone replacement therapy, in which the stroke risk seems to plateau after about five years of taking HRT, that did not seem to be the case uh, in uh, these uh, transgendered women. Uh, the incidence seemed to continue to increase and not plateau. So the reason I'm pointing this out is that it's a, I think it's a mistake to try to extrapolate um, from, for example, postmenopausal uh, uh, cisgendered women on HRT to trans feminine patients on gender affirming hormones. These are different populations. And unfortunately, uh, many of us have uh, simply tried to extrapolate some data uh, from these groups. And this just points out the importance of actually very carefully studying these populations individually, as opposed to just extrapolating what we think we know uh, about other populations. So more studies needed, of course, this is uh, early on in the study or early on in the field, I should say. Um, I wanna also say to, to this group that gender affirming hormone can be life-saving. Um, I think that most folks are aware that the, uh, the rates of suicide in uh, transgender individuals is much higher as compared to the general population. And so withdrawing gender affirming hormone therapy, just because there may be a, an, a conferred and increased stroke risk is a mistake because this can directly impact uh, a person's uh, survival, truly. Um, so there are ways to get creative with the way that we do gender affirming hormone therapy. And so in an individual that's at increased risk of stroke or has um, experienced a stroke, there are ways in which we can change up uh, gender affirming hormone uh, therapy. So for example, we can focus on minimizing endogenous testosterone uh, as opposed to just supplementing with estrogen. Uh, you may also consider androgen blockade uh, as, again, gender affirming hormone uh, uh, therapy that does not necessarily increase an individual's risk for cardiovascular um, morbidity and mortality. So we can do this. I know it's not necessarily something that um, is part of the standard uh, neurology curriculum, but uh, it can be done and it can be done really well. And uh, you can be of great service to your patients in this, in this arena. As you can tell from what I've presented, there are so many questions that we still have yet uh, about these populations. And so you can see there's just a really lengthy list. Um, this, uh, this review article is a few years old now. It was uh, first authored by my colleague, uh, Nicole Rosendale, who's doing some really trailblazing work in this area. But you can see, so for all of you in the audience, considering embarking on a clinical research career, there are so many things to investigate, um, uh, particularly for this patient population. And so uh, the, it's sort of a blue sky kind of uh, opportunity. Let's go back to case two. So your patient's been receiving unopposed exogenous estrogen as a hormone replacement. Uh, and you know that estrogen has some pro-convulsive properties, whereas progesterone has anti-convulsive properties very generally. And I'm simplifying. I know the epileptologists in the room are like, oh, I'm simplifying a bit. So you may consider for your patient um, to change up their gender affirming hormone therapy that could uh, help improve their seizure frequency. And so I had mentioned in a previous slide about uh, minimizing endogenous testosterone, androgen blockade. These are all options for your patient. Uh, and you may even add progesterone to the regimen. Uh, so all of these are of consideration as opposed to just telling your patient, stop your gender affirming hormone therapy and your seizures will be better, which would I think be a disservice to your patient. Let's talk briefly about cultural competency and medical education. This is improving fortunately, but when I was a student, I really got very little information in this space. Um, and, uh, and I think many of you who have been on faculty for a while maybe share that experience with me. Before we get into that, uh, our third and final case, this is a 52-year-old right-handed man who presents to the NeurICU, gotta be neurocritical care, you know, I, this is my uh, sort of home place. Uh, with new onset seizure, right sided weakness and aphasia. Initially, the concern was over stroke, but when you get the imaging, you see that there appears to be a solitary metastasis and it's just right at the gray-white junction. So you're thinking, okay, this, uh, this could be a primary brain tumor, but I'm concerned that this is a, a map from something else. So we need to do some work up here. 
All right. I mentioned that um, at least historically, medical professionals receive very little cultural competency training uh, with regard to sexual and gender minority health education. So at least you know, 10 years ago, uh, more than half of medical students rated their curriculum as fair or worse or non-existent in, in my case when I trained uh, now some years ago. And so with no training, many providers feel deep discomfort surrounding some of these topics. And so for this reason, uh, you can imagine that, uh, that folks don't really talk about things. And so this leads to inadequate health screening and prevention and sometimes misdiagnosis. And that type of care unfortunately contributes to disparities for this patient population. And it can be addressed with adequate education. I hope, I hope so. Um, so I just wanted to sort of tell you briefly that, um, that this was one of the reasons that I founded the LGBTQI section at AAN. And our mission was really twofold. The most important piece was to promote equal access to quality neurologic care and eliminations of disparities in treatment outcomes through education and research for sexual and gender minorities. We also want to enhance the professional development of neurologists with respect to cultural competency uh, in this area of healthcare. And then also to improve the retention and promotion of those individuals who are historically underrepresented in medicine, uh, specifically sexual and gender minorities, and to, in, to bolster inclusivity in the training of neurologists. And so we have a Synapse page. And so if you're interested in, um, in joining, this section is, is really for everyone, any AAN uh, member that's interested in these topics. You don't have to self-identify as someone uh, within the sexual and gender minority uh, community. It's really for anyone who's curious about these topics and wants to learn more. So coming back to case three, um, this patient underwent, uh, this is something we do very standardly, uh, CT chest, uh, abdomen, pelvis, and it was noted that there was a small speculated mass in the chest wall. And um, so with, armed with that information, the patient underwent uh, a brain biopsy, and it was consistent with adenocarcinoma. Hopefully by this point, you aren't just learning this, but your patient is actually um, transmasculine and had undergone a... Uh, uh, subcutaneous mastectomy, sometimes referred to as top surgery, and had not been told that um, they needed to continue breast cancer screening uh, after this procedure. But in fact, that was important. This patient had a strong family history of uh, breast cancer, and so that residual tissue uh, became a huge problem for this individual. So this is why uh, having very frank conversations, doing things like organ inventories are potentially life-saving for patients. Uh, I mentioned that we conducted a survey of, uh, of AAN members to understand a little bit better where AAN members were at in terms of their knowledge base of sexual and gender minority healthcare, as well as their comfort levels for taking care of these patients. And so uh, we conducted a survey uh, back in uh, 20, gosh, 2017, 2018, the years, the years uh, blend together now post-pandemic, but um, we, through the AN Insights team, were able to uh, uh, identify a subset of AN members and then send out, push out this survey. To give you a feel for what some of the questions looked like, uh, I think we had 27 questions total, and the instrument was adapted from a prior uh, study or survey instrument that was used in primary care, but we adapted it for uh, specifically for neurologists. And so you can see some of the questions um, below. They were on a Likert scale and questions were like sexual orientation, gender identity have little bearing on the management of neurologic illness. I hope that um, after this talk, you would circle disagree or maybe strongly disagree. Um, but we just wanted to know where folks were at with, uh, with their knowledge base and their uh, comfort level. And so we uh, sent this survey to a random sample of 1,000 US-based AAN uh, member neurologists um, in 2018. We excluded some officers at AAN. We also pushed the survey uh, initially via electronically and then uh, secondarily through paper. There are some folks that prefer paper surveys, mind-blowing but true. And we got an okay response rate. I mean, it seems pretty low, but I, as I understand it for surveys, this was somewhat reasonable. So first off, we wanted to make sure that the survey respondents were representative of the uh, 
the, the population overall, and we're not biased to the folks that filled out the survey. We're all uh, just, you know, sort of the younger neurologists are all concentrated on the coast or something of this nature. And we, uh, we actually found, fortunately, that uh, with respect to age, uh, and this should be sex, not gender, uh, in practice setting, uh, that there were no differences between the survey respondents and the non-respondents, which was reassuring. And then we also wanted to look at the survey sample versus the A and population as a whole. And again, in those three dimensions, there were no statistically significant differences. So we felt that our survey sample was representative. And you can see where the uh, responses came from. There was a, a, a little bit more of a higher reporting in California, but pretty well distributed throughout the United States. And so what did we learn? Well, first off, most respondents rec recognize that uh, lesbian, gay, or bisexual identity is a social determinant of health, so that's great. Um, curiously, less were convinced that gender identity was a social determinant of health, but um, true. Most uh, felt comfortable examining sexual and gender minority patients, although there was a slight non-statistically significant difference in between um, examining uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual patients versus transgender patients. This was really surprising to us that less than a third would tailor their care to sexual and gender minorities, despite this uh, perceived high comfort level. And this is a disconnect. And I hope that I've convinced you through today's talk that there is some importance to tailoring your care, that the needs are different. And you should imagine uh, when, you, when you create your treatment care plan that this, is, um, that this identity would impact how you might approach certain, um, certain neurologic illnesses. 44% uh, said that sexual and gender minority uh, identity had no bearing on neurologic care, um, but half uh, felt like it was important to gather the data for the uh, EHR, and more than half wanted to learn more on this topic. So there's an opportunity here, fortunately. Um, so we created uh, a couple of different courses, uh, mainly this first one, LGBTQI Health and Neurology, uh, which is now, this will be, I think, the fourth year we've presented this at the annual meeting, will be very similar than uh, to the talk that I've given today. Um, I'm the course director, I won't be speaking, but uh, some wonderful speakers here. And there have been some additional courses added, particularly this one, Neurologic Conditions and Transgender Patients. It's its own standalone uh, course, kind of the, the 201 uh, for the 101 uh, that we've offered now for a while. So I would encourage you if you're at the annual meeting to consider attending one or both of these sessions. Uh, there are also uh, resources beyond the annual meeting. There's some great uh, parts of the AAN website about diversity initiatives I would encourage you to, uh, to look at. And then also, you know, outside of those AAN resources, you might be asking yourself, well, okay, you've convinced me, I've seen this data, what, what can I do as an individual caring for patients? And there are a number of things that you actually can personally do to improve your practice in this area. And the first of which is, if this patient population is brand new to you, if you don't have necessarily a high knowledge base or comfort level, consider participating in some of these cultural competency education uh, resources. And I'll show you some additional ones that you can do desynchronously on your own that are free. You can also uh, consider recommending this training for all office staff, so not just the provider team. And why this is important is you can have all this knowledge base and be ready to go. And then the front desk staff misgenders your patient and like the whole encounter gets uh, put on the wrong foot. So, um, so considering broadening uh, the, the group that's going to participate in, in sort of this um, education is really helpful. Also too, I mean, it seems silly, but just outward signals to patients that they won't face discrimination is really helpful. A lot of us will have sort of um, pins on our badges or this, that, and the other uh, sort of indicating uh, a friendliness to this patient population. So that's really helpful. Um, also being very aware of the posters, the literature in the office, kind of the who is depicted in those images, I think is really important. And that supersedes sexual and gender minorities, but just very broadly uh, to all folks that are uh, underrepresented. And then also to asking for a preferred name uh, and pronouns, especially when the records don't match um, is, is really important. And to really 
identify your patients by the, in the way in which they request to be identified. It shows deep respect for your patients, which will um, frankly improve their healthcare. Um, folks will be more forthcoming and um, it builds a, a lot more trust with your patients um, when you outwardly display that type of respect. Get to know your patients. Uh, again, this is just good general advice. Understand their living circumstances, who their partners are. And then also too, when a, when a person refers to their, um, for example, uh, their spouse, their wife, their husband, echo that terminology. Um, don't suddenly switch to a new word. If, this, uh, if your patient identifies the other person in the room as their husband, then go with that. That's husband. You know, Don't sort of use euphemisms or switch things up. Again, just follow your patient's lead in, in, uh, in what, how they identify their loved ones. I also wanted to, uh, well, in this section, I'd like to show you some additional resources that you may use that are national and, and quite good and for free. And the first of which is based out of Boston. This is the Fenway Institute, which is a local clinic, but also has tremendous resources uh, for uh, really just very broadly for healthcare uh, providers at any level, not just physicians, but, but anyone involved in the healthcare apparatus. All you have to do is sort of sign up with an email address and then uh, you have access to their library of webinars that you can do at your own pace and your own time and uh, really fantastic just general knowledge base uh, type of education. Um, also too, I had mentioned earlier in my talk that uh, LGBT elders are a special unique population. There's a great organization called SAGE that focuses specifically on this group. There are a multitude of things that uh, you know, I hadn't even really considered such as discrimination in elder care and assisted living. They're just like all these different resources and um, aspects that are special to this population. So I'd encourage you to, uh, to go here if, um, if this is of interest. And then I'll stop there. I just want to thank all the many uh, folks that have helped support this work, uh, particularly the AAN. Uh, also, I wanted to call out my uh, survey task force that helped me create, distribute, analyze, and write up the survey results. Uh, and uh, and I'll just uh, I'll just stop there and take your questions. So thank you so much for your attention. I really appreciate it. And I'll stop sharing here. Thank you so much, Dr. Kinsa. That was a very like amazing like late short. So now we open the uh, microphone uh, for the audience. So if someone had a question, just go, can go ahead. Uh, also, you can type questions in, in the chat if you prefer that. Uh, thank you, Dr. Henson. That was that was really a wonderful talk. Uh, I have one quick question. Um, what are some ways that you have? Uh, that you've taught medical students and residents in, you know, generally med ed uh, about cultural humility, about, um, about LGBTQIA++. Well, I think the first thing is that uh, we're all learning. I include myself in this group. Uh, there are, I, you know, while I think about these issues often, I have messed up and I have not done things properly uh, in the past. And I think the first, uh, the first sort of tenet is, is to, um, is, you know, with ourselves, you know, we have to approach this like any other topic and to try to model the behavior of sort of your best resident, which is that, you know, when things are pointed out to you to, um, is to take that feedback graciously and to try to improve. Um, so nobody, nobody's going to nail this perfectly every single time. And so I think the continually trying to educate yourself to improve, to learn more, um, at, particularly about experiences that you personally haven't had, I think is really the, the goes a long way to, to, um, to, you know, showing your patients that this is important and to, and to really to, to take care of them, uh, them better. And I would say also too, all of us have very different experiences, um, uh, sort of as we move through the world. And so, 
really trying to educate yourself about uh, experiences that you haven't had to reach out to try to gain some of these, uh, you know, access some of these resources is really, really helpful. Um, so I know that's just very broad in general, uh, but I think, again, holding space for the ability to, um, to, to grow, to grow in this, uh, in this area is, is really helpful. So I don't know if that totally answers your question, but I don't know. I mean, I, um, I wouldn't posit myself as this great expert in all things and like, you know, like I never get it wrong. I, I certainly have, uh, have learned a lot um, starting to, to do this work um, just even, you know, uh, since I founded the section, so. No, thank you. Yeah. I, I, think that's, I think that's helpful. And I think educating yourself and, and role modeling uh, is, is really one of the key ways. So I, I definitely agree. Are there any other questions uh, for the audience? Mm. So I think if uh, there are no more questions. Uh, uh, I, I, I guess I have another question. Okay. Oops, um, thank you for the talk. Um, and I just had a very quick question, you know, kind of just given the uh, political climate of the United States, Especially, you know, in Texas, I think recently with, uh, you know, the passage of uh, these uh, anti sort of abortion laws where, you know, now it seems kind of like citizens are being encouraged to pursue vigilante sort of justice against physicians. I was just kind of wondering, I mean, do you have any personal experience with uh, similar situations uh, as far as you know, these LGBT issues occur, and how do you think we should uh, deal with this as physicians? Yeah, this is incredibly tough, right? I mean, you saw the slide; it was sort of like the rip from the headlines piece. You know, Greg Abbott, who's the current governor of Texas, uh, had encouraged uh, essentially um, folks to report parents to Child Protective Services for. Um, Getting gender affirming hormone uh, care to their their to their own children, uh, which is just the most horrifying thing. I mean, this is healthcare, right? I mean, uh, I just just for some perspective, um, puberty blockers, which are sometimes used as uh, part of gender affirming care and for transgender children, are offered uh, for many other indications, right? I mean, uh, for precocious puberty specifically is one other indication. So it's not like you know this this sort of like well, I want to, <laughs> I can feel the tachycardia, you guys. So, um, so I think making, um, I, I think just being very clear and unified that healthcare is, uh, I believe, a human right and, uh, and, and sort of, sort of standing firm as a medical profession that no, this is legitimate healthcare. This is not uh, something that is um, radical or, you know, really off the beaten path or certainly not uh, child abuse. Uh, I think sometimes position statements can be helpful um, to just show that unification of, of, of the medical profession. But, um, but it's tough, right? I mean, there are, you, you know, you can get kind of caught in a cycle of responding to every sort of outrageous statement that's made by, you know, uh, a particular official in every state. Um, so it, it's like, when, when, when does it end? But, uh, but I think having an awareness that this type of thing is ongoing, it's current, and it contributes to stigma. And um, this is like a horrible message that uh, parents and children are getting. Um, that they can't, you know, come to their healthcare provider and get help with, with these types of things. And so we need to try to um, work against that as much as we can and be supportive of parents and children getting the healthcare they need. So, um, so it's a tough one, right? I mean, it's really, really tough. But, um, but I think just growing awareness that the, these kinds of, of things are ongoing. Uh, is really great. And I see uh, in the chat that uh, Dr. Uh, Lilario had just put in about a question about uh, how do we engage with external organizations like um, uh, WPATH to create a trans neurology specialty. That's a wonderful 
wonderful question that uh, that I, I don't know if I can offer a tremendous amount of expertise, but just to say there are some fantastic medical organizations out there that are um, independent of neurology, but certainly can intersect. So there is uh, what used to be termed Glama, but I think they've changed their name now. Uh, WPATH is another really uh, fantastic organization. Um, and then uh, I, I see that there was a there's a, a link to a, an article in the chat, so that's great. I'll have to have to take a look at that. But I think uh, recognizing that um, there is uh, some specific topical expertise in this area, uh, uh, specifically uh, a trans neurology, almost like a subspecialty. I think knowing that there is some very specific knowledge base here, and I think I showed you some examples where this would come into play. Uh, recognizing that and, and acknowledging that um, expertise in that area is really helpful for our patients is is great. I think um, so. I'm I'm all for it. I think that's a fantastic suggestion. Perfect. I also just wanted to say, um, if you uh, would like to engage another way, uh, I put my email up on the screen. It's just Henson at OHSU. Uh, I also am pretty active on Twitter, so happy to uh, take questions uh, in other forums too. And just thank you so much for the invitation and your attention. And um, I hope to bump into you at AAN. Thank you so much, Dr. Hinzo. That was a really great topic, great lecture. Uh, thank you so much for like uh, giving this lecture. Thanks, everyone.